Uh, good morning to everyone joining us from Europe and good morning and good afternoon to everyone joining us from the Gulf. Welcome to the third in this series of our webinars jointly hosted between and Trowels and Hamlins. Today we'll be discussing issues around understanding the sovereign and quasi-sovereign wealth opportunity in the Middle East. My name is Nick Green and I'm a corporate partner and part of the International Funds team here at Trowels and Hamlins in Dubai. I'm pleased to be representing Trowels today alongside my fellow partner, Brian Howard, based out of Bahrain and head of our international funds team. Brian will be the moderator for today's panel session. We are be delighted to be hosting this webinar with our friends at Jersey Finance. And very shortly, you'll be here from, uh, hearing from our co-host, Basil Barner, who is a director at Jersey Finance. For those of you that don't know my firm, Trowels and Hamlins, we are a London headquartered international law firm with a deep and rich history in the Middle East. We've been active in the Gulf region for over 60 years. And in fact, our regional practice was born with a sovereign start when we began advising the Bahrain government in the late 1950s. To assist in discussing some of the key current issues in the sovereign and quasi-sovereign space today, we have an experienced panel of experts lined up for you as well as an influential keynote speaker. So I'd like to start by introducing our panel who will be answering the questions and debating the issues. First up, we have my fellow partner, Brian Howard, I already mentioned, is head of our international funds practice and also head of the corporate team in Bahrain. Brian regularly advises clients in respect to public and private company mergers and acquisitions, corporate structuring and regulation, and also general funds and corporate matters. Brian acts for a number of sovereign investor clients and will be using that experience as the moderator of today's panel. Next up is Mohammed Al Sayed, who is the manager of the Public-Private Partnership Division at the Islamic Development Bank, responsible for the development, structuring and delivery of the bank's PPP portfolio across ISDB's 57 member countries. Mohammed has more than 20 years of experience in designing, implementing and financing infrastructure projects in both the public and private sector. We're also lucky to have Fatima Akhtazara, who is the head of mutual funds authorization and supervision at the Central Bank of Bahrain. Fatima is responsible for ensuring the proper oversight of all affairs related to locally domiciled and internationally uh, domiciled uh, collective investment undertakings in the Kingdom of Bahrain, and has also been looking after mutual funds at the CVB since 2007. Sara Nouradin is the Head of Private Investments at the Seoul Asset Management, which acts on behalf of an, a number of underlying sovereign clients. Sara has many years of experience in private investing. She has been at Seoul since 2013 and is responsible for sourcing, evaluating and monitoring both fund managers and investment opportunities globally for Seoul and its underlying sovereign clients. Next up is Zina Kupi who is Chief Commercial Officer at LGL Group, where she's responsible for leading the product and jurisdictional expansion of business whilst ensuring seamless client service delivery. Zena has spent over 15 years focused on servicing Middle Eastern clients, sovereign wealth funds and families, assisting them in particular with the structuring and holding of international real estate assets. We also have Hira Sharma, who is a London-based tax partner in the real estate construction group at BDO. Hero advises a wide range of investors, developers, occupiers, and public sector organisations in relation to their UK and global property interests. Included within his clients are a number of Asian and Middle Eastern so sovereign wealth funds, all of whom are invested in global real estate. And last, but by no means least, we have Mirek Bruner, Chief Commercial Officer at IQEQ in Jersey. Mirak has more than 15 years experience in financial services with a particular focus on working with institutional investors to implement and oversee governance structures for their international investments. Mirak has also acted as a director on the boards of a number of entities owned by listed companies and also sovereign wealth funds and will bring that experience to bear on our panel today. So that's the panel of expert speakers we have lined up. But before we kick off the panel discussion, uh, we have 
uh, a special treat for you. We are very privileged today to have a keynote presentation from Epitsam al Arayed, the Director of the Financial Institutions Directorate at the Central Bank of Bahrain. On top of her private sector experience, Eptisam has over 15 years experience as a senior financial regulator at the CBB, previously holding the position of regulatory policy, and more recently as director of financial institution supervision. Now, before I hand over to my co-host Faisal, one quick point of housekeeping. We are hoping to have 10 minutes or so at the end of the panel discussion to allow time for a Q&A session. But if the panel overruns and we don't have time for that, then we will endeavor to follow up with all specific questions asked. So please do put those in the Q&A box, which you should find at the bottom uh, of your screens. I'd now like to hand you over to my co-host, Faisal Barna, Director of Middle East, Africa and India at Jersey Finance. So over to you, Faisal. Thank you very much, Nick, uh, and a warm welcome from me uh, to all that are listening in today. I think we have uh, close to 400 that have registered for this event um, this morning. So thank you very much. And it's a global audience, uh, like you mentioned, Nick. So we have people from across the globe um, and we hope you find this discussion relevant. Um, uh, uh, it, I'd, I'd like to sort of start by start uh, uh, thanking our hosts. Again, Trowers and Hamlins, this is the third in, a, in our series with them over the last 15 months. Um, so thank you very much, Brian and Nick and the team at Trowers. Uh, and a thank you also from me to all of our panelists. You've heard their very impressive uh, biographies and experience. Um, uh, we're, we're delighted you're here with us and sharing your insights with us. So thank you very much for that. Uh, Jersey Finance is delighted to be supporting this very important topic understanding the sovereign quasi-sovereign opportunities, primarily in the Middle East. But like I say, we hope some of the key issues identified are likely to be universal and therefore applicable globally and relevant to, uh, to people beyond the Middle East. Uh, Jersey Finance, for those that don't know us, uh, we are a not-for-profit promoting and championing uh, our excellent financial services sector in Jersey. Uh, as the leader in a future in future focused international finance and uh, our jurisdiction as an international finance center uh, for, of, of global ex uh, excellence. We I'm delighted, as men, uh, Nick mentioned, we have a couple of our member firms uh, from IQEQ and LGL, uh, Merrick and Zena respectively on the panel. And I hope you get to hear some of that expertise in action today. Our relationship also, Nick, uh, with the Middle East, um, uh, in particular the GCC, is based on uh, collaboration, uh, mutual respect and understanding, and a partnership that, that is complementary, providing mutual benefit. And we have a uh, long history in the Middle East. Our member firms, our government, uh, representatives from our industry have been traveling, partnering, collaborating for decades. Um, uh, and obviously uh, our relationship, um, as, as all would be aware, is beyond finance. Uh, but today we're focused obviously uh, on the finance industry and specifically sovereign wealth funds. Uh, we, have we celebrate several significant milestones this year. It's important to highlight that, um, not only as a commitment to the region, but also uh, on a global basis. Um, it's 10 years this year for us um, since we opened our regional office. Uh, 20 years since uh, JFL or Jersey Finance was formed as a not-for-profit and 60 years uh, for Jersey as an international finance center of excellence uh, on a global basis. So we're very, very proud of our heritage. Um, our commitment to the GCC is evidenced further by the various information exchange agreement protocols, regulatory agreements and memorandum of understandings that we've, we have with governments across the GCC providing a clear, transparent, and an open relationship within the bounds of the various agreements. We are delighted also to have uh, the CBB participating, the Central Bank of Bahrain participating this morning. Thank you very much, Ibtisam and uh, Fatima for taking the time out this morning to be with us. Um, Jersey's finance industry complements uh, the excellent, well-established and regulated financial services infrastructure in the region. And the C Central Bank of Bahrain is, uh, is perhaps one of the most sophisticated regulators in the region. 
Uh, Jersey Finance is proud of our strategic collaboration with the Central Bank of Bahrain. In summary, our IFC provides an international platform, an award-winning, globally recognized, robustly regulated, stable and transport, uh, transparent platform to facilitate, help collaborate and partner with an increasingly uh, globally looking GCC investor, investor base. And hopefully this will all come out in the discussions today. Before I finish, I thought I'll share some facts and figures to bring to life the importance of the sector we're focused on today, and particularly the sovereign wealth funds. Six GCC-based sovereign wealth funds appear in the top 15 list of the world's largest sovereign wealth funds by assets under management. And the combined uh, AUM of these six funds is approximately $2.9 trillion. Globally, direct investments by sovereign wealth funds in 2020 total $65.9 billion, up from a, you know, almost 100% up from the $35.9 billion in 2019. And key to this is the sizable domestic investment that these sovereign wealth funds provide, including in the region, to cushion, uh, to cushion the blow of the COVID crisis. Sovereign wealth funds invested $48.6 billion in direct equity in 2020, more than double of the $22.2 billion that was invested in this class in 2019. And with a particular focus on uh, sectors including renewables, e-commerce, and food production. Finally, sovereign wealth funds in 2020 invested more than $2 billion in climate change related sectors, such as agri-tech, forestry, and renewable energy. There is a segment on ESG and Brian will and his expert panel will discuss the importance of this consideration increasingly uh, in, in investment decisions. Um, I, we hope you find this event useful. I have gone over my time, uh, so I'll stop here and pass to the next speaker, and I'll be available for questions at the end and, and try and wrap up at the end. Uh, without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Ibtisam al al -Rayat, the Director of uh, Financial Institution Sh Supervision Directorate at the Central Bank of Bahrain. Welcome, Ibtisam. Thank you, Fraser. Thank you very much for the very informative information. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be here today to address uh, the Sovereign Wealth event. I would like to commend the organizers for putting together a stimulating panel discussion, which will no doubt enrich the ongoing dialogue on sovereign wealth uh, opportunities in the Middle East. I would also like to extend a warm welcome to the panelists for taking the time to contribute to this event. The mutual fund industry has grown to become an increasingly substantial segment within the international financial markets and has gained significant interest as an efficient type of investment. The Kingdom of Bahrain is a host to a thriving mutual funds industry. The first overseas uh, mutual funds started by being marketed in Bahrain during the 1980s and the first Bahrain domicile scheme was launched in 1984. As at the end of August 2021, the number of mutual funds stood at 1,683 funds, of which 74 funds were Bahrain domiciled. The number of Sharia compliant funds stood at 91 as of August 2021. Uh, the number of those funds total 10.1 uh, billion US dollar as of the end of June 2021, reflecting a 49.7% increase compared to 6.7 billion US dollar the previous year. Of the total NAV, 5.7 uh, billion US dollar is invested in locally incorporated funds and 1.1 billion US dollar in Sharia compliant funds. It is worth noting that around 40% of the NAV of all funds in Bahrain are related to sovereign wealth funds. The first collective investment scheme rules were issued by the CBB in 1992 
and were subsequently developed in 2007 when the CIU module within CVB rulebook volume six was issued. The rules were further developed and issued in a separate volume number seven of the CBB rulebook. The CBB, through its enabling legislation, promotes the development of new products for investors in both conventional and Islamic financial markets, while, uh, while, while at the same time providing credible regulation in both areas. The existing regulatory framework for CIUs has provided for full range of investment funds catering for various types of investors, from retail to high net worth individual and institutional investors. In order to further enhance the existing CIU frameworks, the CBB has issued Volume 7 rulebook, as I mentioned earlier, which provides comprehensive rules and regulation pertaining to the authorization and supervision of CIUs domiciled or offered in Bahrain. The regulation has recognized the importance of expanding key areas such as corporate governance, as well as the role and responsibility of each relevant party in a scheme. It also expands the variety of funds that can be established in Bahrain by introducing rules governing real estate investment trust, uh, private investment undertaking, which I will uh, elaborate on uh, during my uh, keynote speech, and the exchange traded funds. Uh, in keeping with Bahrain leadership in Islamic finance, uh, the CIU rules also provide a solid foundation for the establishment and management of mutual fund funds that comply with Sharia principle. Bahrain has a sound and will establish infrastructure to set up a mutual funds, which has placed it as one of the most desirable jurisdiction in the region. The flexibility of the regulation has been attracting the biggest sovereign wealth funds in the region, such as Kuwait, Abu Dhabi, and Bahrain, where they have chosen the private invest investment undertaking, PIUs structure, because it serves their mandate. The POIUs are structures that have been created to facilitate private investments with a capacity to fit the criteria of such schemes. They present a very flexible framework to set up funds that are only regulated to the extent that they are subject to some reporting requirement with light supervision for the purpose of monitoring the growth and development in the financial services sector. The role of CBB is limited to processing the registration of POUs in line with the PIU module of Rulebook Volume 7 and to subsequently gather statistical information relating to them. POUs are not subject to any restrictions on their investment policies. They can only be offered to high net worth individuals and institutional investors. As part of the CBB continuous efforts to enhance its regulatory framework in order to cater for recent trend in the international financial markets, it has recently introduced uh, a new license category of investment firm uh, uh, specialized for asset management firms specialized in operating and managing collective investment undertaking targeted at accredited investors. The new reg regulation recognizes the unique risk posed by such fund manager given their business model and the sophisticated investor base and therefore it maintains high standards of business conduct, including measure to safeguard client assets and require disclosure standards to investors in line with international best practice. It is worth noting that the CBB has issued three laws in 2016, the trust law, the limited partnership law, and the protected cell companies law. The, the three laws are serving the regional specialized financial institutions that are actively involved in, in the structuring of investment products in particular. While many of which are focused on investment based in the region, they find an added value 
in utilizing a Bahraini legal structure for, establish, for the establishment of their investment vehicles. The three laws aim at widening the choices available to banks and other financial institutions to structure their investment products using legal frameworks the legal frameworks that are internationally recognized and widely used for alternative investments. Bahrain was one of the first countries in the region to have a trust law and to recognize the concept of trust. The earlier trust law was introduced in 2006 and has been replaced by Decree 23 of 2016, which has been enhanced to be in line with the trust law standard applied in a prominent international jurisdictions such as Jersey. The law has been widened to include a new type of a trust such as charitable and non-charitable trust, banks can fulfill their corporate social responsibilities using the trust structure. It is worth noting that the Kingdom of Bahrain and Jersey have shared strong cooperation ties in the financial services field. In this context, the Financial Services Commission of Jersey and the Bahrain Monetary Agency, currently the Central Bank of Bahrain, have signed a memorandum of understanding in 2002 on supervisory cooperation. The MOU establishes a general framework for supervisory cooperation, enforcement and, and, enforcement and information sharing. In 2019, Bahrain and Jersey signed an MOU to work together to drive digital innovation across both jurisdictions and to encourage more women into the sector and to assist entrepreneurs to create digital businesses, products and services with particular focus on those that will help the finance industry. The agreement between the two leading jurisdictions in the fintech sector seeks to build cooperation as an extension of Bahrain's effort to internationalize its domestic success in digitizing its financial services sector. The MOU has been signed by representative from the Digital Jersey and the Bahrain Economic Development Board. I also want to shed light on an important topic that has been growing rapidly on a global scale. Sustainable finance is fast becoming a separate asset class globally. Under the umbrella of sustainable finance, environmental, social, and governance practices are growing rapidly as a differentiator within the banking and financial services sector. Data is at the heart of sustainable finance, and more accurate data collection is critical for growth of sustainable finance. It is not only important for customers to know more transparently about banking and financial products and services, but it is also critical for regulators and policymakers to develop their respective regulatory and policy interventions. In view of the above, the CBB and the Bahrain Association of Banks formed a joint sustainability committee to assess the current state of sustainable finance in Bahrain, the committee have been conducting a study on, on financial institutions' current ESG practices in order to assess the current status of the licensees regarding their awareness about sustainability and the preparedness for a sustainable future. It is a prerequisite for any policy action that the CBB may decide to take in the near future, such as voluntary or mandatory ESG reporting in a pre-approved format. Moreover, the Bahrain Institute of Banking and Finance is studying the launch of its Sustainable Development Academy, where it will offer short courses on the topics to the board, senior management, and other staff of financial institutions. Fitch Learning and the London Institute of Banking and Finance have been contacted to help in designing the curriculum. It is worth noting that Bahrain Supreme Council for Environment 
has taken on a lead for sustainable development and green initiatives, and they are at the early stage of their development of a national program around these initiatives. The CBB has started having conversations with the Bahrain Supreme Council for Environment in relation to the financial sector role in the potential national program. Bahrain Bourse also launched its voluntary ESG reporting guideline for listed companies and other stakeholders. The ESG guidelines include the latest reporting methodologies widely adopted by uh, the industry and enables listed companies to navigate through the evolving standard on ESG data disclosure. Over the recent months, we have noticed that big number of the leaders in the fund industry have been adapting and modifying their strategies to align their fund with the latest ESG criteria. Ladies and gentlemen, the CBB intends to remain at the forefront of regulating the mutual funds industry, and we look forward to work closely with market players to further develop the, this key industry. I hope that the discussions during this webinar would highlight and shed light on important area of sovereign wealth funds that would contribute towards further development and growth of the regional sovereign, fund, sovereign wealth fund domain. Thank you and wish you a very successful conference. Thank you very much, Ebtazan. That was an absolutely excellent keynote speech. And I've learned, I've been here a long time and I've learned an awful lot uh, from that. Um, what I would like to, to point out is uh, had the flexibility that uh, the central bank buying has shown fund sponsors uh, that we've been working with in terms of structuring. And that's particularly appreciated, I think, from the industry participants that we work with. So I'd like to move on. Thank you, um, Ebtazan. And Good I'd like on. to welcome our panel. Um, before we get stuck in uh, with some of the detailed areas we'll be discussing today, I think it, we'd all agree that it's been a complicated period with the pandemic in relation to investment structuring and investments. And it might be worth considering if there's been a change of approach in relation to the structures used and the associated domicile choices um, and whether or not the same jurisdictions are still being utilised. So I'd like to start with Mirek Gruner, the Chief Commercial Officer of IQEQ. Merrick, which jurisdictions and structures are currently most popular for new sovereign wealth investments and funds structures? And what factors are driving the choice of domicile and structure? Thank you, Brian. And uh, good afternoon. Good morning, all. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be on this panel. And obviously, thank you, um, Jesse Finance, for coordinating this, this great uh, discussion. So, Brian, over to your point. Um, I don't think there is a pattern of a most popular jurisdiction, to be honest. Um, although having said that, it seems that there is often a link being political or cultural between certain sovereign wealth funds and the jurisdictions where they usually place their structures. For example, sovereign wealth funds based in Asia tend to use holding vehicles based in Hong Kong or the Cayman Islands historically or for commercial reasons, whereas some sovereign wealth funds based in the Middle East tend to use some European uh, financial services centers like Jersey or Luxembourg, but sometimes it is places like uh, the Netherlands, the UK or the US. But uh, going back to Eptisam's point, uh, more recently we have seen the emergence of high quality financial service centers based in the GCC region. So the choice of domiciles clearly tend to be within the region. From discussions I have had with some of the Southern Wealth Funds we have been working closely with, the choice of jurisdiction needs to be, shall we say, sometimes politically correct. In other words, there is an element of political influence, sometimes exercise, when the choice of jurisdiction for domicile of investment structure is decided. The asset class and geography of the target asset often plays a decisive role for the choice of appropriate jurisdiction, but so is the type of investment. I have seen that if it is a direct P investment, often a local onshore holding company selected, but if the the sovereign wealth fund invests in a you know co-invest as, as an institutional investor into a large PE fund, quite often it is left to the fund manager to decide the suitable domicile for the fund. Usually, I think the decision is sits between the internal legal and co-sec departments within sovereign wealth funds, and the criteria such as speed of setup, 
ease of administration and accessibility to a pool of qualified and skilled administrators, as well as legal accountants and audit professionals as a key requirement. More recently, cost has increasingly become a consideration for some well funds. And often procurement committees of around big RFPs on a regular or maybe trigger point basis, usually a three-year cycle I've seen with regards to funds vendors, being it administrators, legal uh, you know, lawyers, tax advisors, or even auditors. Thank you, Merrick. Um, turning to Zina Kupi, the uh, Chief Commercial Officer from LGL, Merrick mentioned that asset class and geography are two of the key factors driving uh, the choices. With real estate and infrastructure forming a key component of most sovereign wealth portfolios, what are you seeing in the real estate investment sector in terms of the structures used? Well, thank you for having me today. I'm delighted to be on the panel. Um, we obviously focus a lot on uh, real estate infrastructure and debt. So in terms of structuring, we are seeing some of the biggest sovereign wealth fund taking um use of sovereign immunity when it comes to structuring, more so now than probably we've seen before. Um, real estate remains a popular asset class for them, and we're seeing them use the Jersey private fund regime due to its flexibility, efficiency um, of setup. We also see Luxembourg unregulated funds products used, such as RAFES, and also a shift for onshoring with UK real estate. And obviously the recent changes to the REIT regime have, that's become a popular choice for um, sovereign wealth funds. I think a move away from traditional types of investing, from potential trophy assets, into different new sectors such as data centers, healthcare, life science, time living. Um, and so a real diverse and shift of the type of assets that are being acquired into portfolios. Thank you, Zina. And I'm delighted to welcome you, Mohammed, from the Islamic Development Bank. Um, you've obviously had a number of significant roles connected with sovereign wealth um, in your time there. What's the role of development banks in complementing sovereign wealth funds? Thank you, Brian, and it's a pleasure to be on this wonderful panel. Um, as you mentioned, the, the development banks complement the investment of the, of the um, wealth funds, uh, specifically when it comes both to upstream and downstream. When it comes to the upstream, it's, it's in the core mandate of the MDBs, the multilateral development banks, to work in developing these ecosystem that actually provide the proper legislative and legal framework that actually attracts those investments. Uh, as we've heard from the previous intervention, I mean, the ease of doing business and the ease of protecting your investment, that's a main factor in determining that. And that's where the development banks comes in, in terms of building the capacity and revolving these frameworks. These things, they don't happen overnight. Obviously, it takes an experience and a trials, sometimes success and failures in order to reach an optimum level for each country to, to have the right and proper framework. Uh, development banks have that leverage and experience to do that, being you know neutral in, in nature and having the mandate of developing the socioeconomic um, environment in, in its member countries. Uh, this capacity building dimension and the governments feeling comfortable in involving MDBs uh, in revolving and developing their frameworks in their countries. That's in terms of the upstream activities. In terms of the downstream activities beyond financing, which people think just you know. Uh, development banks is about is it's also we provide guarantees which i think i've heard you know that that political guarantees is becoming something that is of a keen interest that really needed in, in securing these investments so in both whether upstream downstreams you know mdbs work together jointly in different member countries in the middle east and beyond providing this uh, proper eco you know system for these investments and downward down activities to support these investments and the project as they go on Thank you, Mohammed. Zina, if I could um, bring you back, perhaps, there's been a significant amount of new legislation over the past few years in relation to the structures available, uh, substance, uh, KYT, in many of the most popular jurisdictions. And Epsom has mentioned the stability and flexibility that's offered here in Bahrain. Has the new legislation and the changes around um, substance privacy, KYC, had a bearing on perceptions of certain domiciles? And how much important do you view the balance between stability and flexibility? 
I think both remain critical to the selection of domicile. I think sovereign wealth funds have very well established um, relationships with service providers and domiciles and governments within those domiciles, as we've seen with the Central Bank of Bahrain and Jersey Finance. Um, the domiciles usually selected, as Merrick said, by the location of the asset but it must stand up to scrutiny. I think a lot of the sovereign wealth funds that we deal with have, sat, have signed up to the Santiago principles and therefore they must promote transparency and good governance. So I think flexibility is key. It will remain key. The jurisdictions and domiciles must have a good product selection to enable them to be able to do all of the asset classes across one jurisdiction. Um, but they really must have the stability. I think for me, that's critical. We know that sovereign wealth funds invest for long-term horizons and they don't particularly like to have to change structures once they're familiar with them. So stability of a domicile, I think is key for me. Thank you. Um, and if I can turn to you, Hira Sharma, as a tax partner from BDO, you advise a number of sovereign wealth funds and institutions in relation to their tax position. Uh, in their structures. What would you say are the key considerations you and your clients have to consider from a tax perspective when reviewing investment structures? Thanks, Brian, and sort of a good morning and sort of good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think despite my sort of youthful looks, um, I'm afraid that I've sort of practiced in this sector for over 30 years, and I've sort of seen the sort of development at sovereign wealth funds and the um, evolving approach over the years. Uh, in, in relation to, to tax, I think there are sort of um, there are a number of sort of key criteria which uh, which sovereign wealth funds are now sort of looking at. Firstly, in terms of the you know the structure itself, it needs to be simple in form and easily understandable and sort of comprehensible um, as regards the sovereign wealth fund goes and its sort of stakeholders. In, in the past, I mean, if I've worked to sort of roll back the clock sort of 10, 15 years, it was a case that sovereign wealth funds wanted to be considered, uh, or certain sort of sovereign wealth funds wanted to be considered on a par with conventional investors. So they didn't sort of necessarily wish to sort of take advantage of their sovereign immune status. That has changed quite sub substantially over the last sort of few years. And now we sort of see um, virtually all sovereign wealth funds want to sort of take advantage of their sovereign immune status. And we see sovereign wealth funds moving the, their assets, which have been in conventional sort of taxpaying structures into structures which, uh, which allow them um, to avoid, uh, you know, to legally avoid a, a liability to direct tax. The third thing um, which I'd mentioned is that in terms of the, the risks associated with entering into a structure, um, the technical risk Risks, the tax technical risks and the reputational risks are something which are massively important to sovereign wealth funds who want to be considered as sort of good citizens in the scheme of things. So I think there has to be an upfront assessment of what the what the risk areas are through the lens of the sovereign wealth fund and what the sort of downside implications may be of that. In terms of administering the structure, it, there needs to be um, flexibility and it needs to be relatively easy to, uh, to operate the structure. And the structure needs to sort of cater for black swan events as well, you know, the, uh, the unknown unknowns. Um, and finally, um, in terms of the sort of structure, there needs to be durability. So going into a structure which, you, which doesn't feel right and which is gonna be sort of susceptible to challenge by the sort of tax authorities in future, is, is definitely something which, uh, you know, which Sovereign Wealth wants, wants to sort of shy away from. Thank you, Hira. If I can stay with you for um, a while, I often see a comparison being drawn between onshore regulated structures for which management vehicles and fund structures uh, require uh, specifically, uh, require to be, are required to be specifically licensed and offshore structures which require less in terms of licensing but leave more to the contracts between the parties. Is that still a fair distinction or is the gap between offshore and onshore closing? Well, I think, I mean, let me, um, let me sort of recast the question in a different way in, in the sense that if I was advising a sovereign wealth fund which wanted to um, invest, let's say, in the, in the UK or exclusively in the UK, 
then I would sort of point to an onshore structure as the as the most efficient way of um, executing that investment. Now, by way of example, um, in terms of the UK, the sort of structure which is is becoming um, you know the in vogue is the UK REIT regime. So currently, there are ninety six UK REITs. Um, there is a significant number of those which are um, you know occupied by um, sovereign wealth funds and similar sort of tax exempt investors. The, the tax attributes of a REIT are, are very straightforward as, well, as far as the sovereign wealth fund goes, in that there is no tax on the rental income and there is no tax on the gain. And then from an, an administrative perspective, you know, if ever you have a query, then you can sort of pick up the phone to the HMRC um, REIT team, which comprises of four individuals, and you can get a very pragmatic and sort of quick response in relation to a sort of a specific transaction which you may be, may be sort of considering. So I think, you know, in terms of um, where, where there are sort of jurisdictional specific um, assets, then onshore structures are very much in vogue. If there are going to be sort of um, uh, assets which are going to be sort of spread over a number of jurisdictions, then the use of in, um, intermediate holding companies and entities is, uh, you know, it still seems to be um, in, in, in vogue, or, or, albeit that there are you know, concerted lines of attack um, by various sort of tax authorities and the OECD in relation to the use of um, inter uh, intermediate holding entities, which aren't underpinned by a strong sort of commercial purpose. So I think you know, that, is the, that is the sort of distinction which I would draw, that uh, if it's sort of a local uh, assets, then a local holding entity is appropriate. If, it's, uh, if it transcends cross-border, then, um, then, then sort of intermediate entities uh, which offer sort of tax transparency um, are the other uh, favoured uh, beast of choice. Thank you, here. And if um, Fatima, if I may introduce uh, you here, thank you uh, for uh, joining our panel. Um, obviously, I've worked with you on many occasions uh, on this, uh, and so I, I know from first hand experience uh, the answers to uh, this question, but I think it's an important one. Is there rigidity now um, between offshore? structures essentially unregulated um, and structured in any way uh, that they please and uh, the only onshore structuring that you see is rigid highly regulated um, and whereby the contractual terms um, and understandings of the party are secondary to the regulatory framework or is the gap closing and is there more fluidity now in terms of the range of onshore regulation uh, first of all, thanks, Brian, and uh, it's my pleasure to be today, today here on the panel. Uh, well, uh, to answer this question first, I do agree with Hira that it could be occasional, depending on the case, the asset class that the fund manager is intending to invest in. But if we look at them, the whole thing from a general perspective, uh, what we've been noticing um, as regulators is that the gap has been closing in the sense that offshore jurisdictions and onshore jurisdictions are kind of realigning their licensing regimes, uh, especially after the economic substance requirements. Uh, I think this was a game changer and uh, that for so many onshore jurisdictions that were very lenient and relaxed in the licensing of um, those investment vehicles or investment funds, uh, and they, they had to impose new restrictions or new licensing regimes to have those investment funds or investment vehicles un under the regulatory radar in order for those funds to be um, recognized internationally uh, in other markets as well. But on the other hand, um, onshore jurisdictions had to provide flexibility in order to attract those fund managers and be less rigid, as is just said, and uh, um, give more options to, to those fund managers to come back and do their business in their home jurisdictions. So yes, I do agree that the gap is, is actually closing. And um, I'd like to mention here that Bahrain um, has come a long way in this regard uh, when it comes to economic substance requirements. And um, uh, Bahrain is fully compliant with the technical exchange uh, requirements. Uh, when it comes to economic substance. Um, however, on the same time, uh, we also um, have been striving to maintain uh, us as um, uh, an attractive onshore jurisdiction uh, for fund managers or sovereign wealth fund managers to come and establish their funds uh, with us. 
And uh, we've taken so many initiatives. Uh, I'll just mention one initiative that was um, uh, about the investment uh, business firms. Uh, license. This was um, issued only last month, last September, which is the new category four, uh, which is aiming at venture capital fund managers who wish to establish uh, venture capital funds that are targeting um, uh, high net worth individuals. Of course, this type of license is um, is part of our initiative to give more options to fund managers at a low cost, uh, relatively low cost, and low capital requirements when you compare to the other, other types of licenses, um, while giving them flexibility in their governance and being regulated at the same time. Wonderful, Fatima. Fatima, if I might stay with you, you've overseen the creation of a significant number of funds registered here, um, with the Central Bank of Bahrain. Um, and I know uh, from first-hand experience that you are active at the early stages of fund establishment to help solve the problems of the promoters uh, in that regard. But looking at specifically at the sovereign wealth sector, what available legal structures uh, are there and which ones are most appealing? Yeah. Uh, well, we do have actually uh, a wide range of available uh, legal structures. Uh, they're ranging from the, the, uh, the limited partnership structures under the ILP law in Bahrain. Uh, we have the protected cell companies option. We have the trust law for trust funds. Um, so these options are there. However, the most common option in Bahrain generally is the, joint stock, the closed joint stock company option, uh, which has been the most common option here because it's the um, it has been there for a while, it's well tested, and fund managers are very comfortable with this structure. Um, the sovereign wealth funds that we have in Bahrain uh, are mostly under the, the closed joint stock company, under commercial companies law in Bahrain. Um, however, on the fund side, we also provide um, a wide range of categories of funds from retail to exempt funds and uh, private investment undertakings. And I'd like to shed light on private investment undertakings in specific because these have been the most favorable structures or categories by sovereign wealth fund managers um, um, in the region at least because of the flexibility that they provide in terms of uh, um, uh, segregation of duties um, of the relevant persons, uh, simplified the legal structure of having those funds and this has actually um, um, created a momentum in uh, uh, sovereign, for, sovereign wealth funds um, uh, establishment in Bahrain. So what we've noticed lately is that um, uh, the value of sovereign wealth funds have increased tremendously in Bahrain as a percentage of onshore funds. So 64% of our onshore funds are actually sov sovereign wealth funds. And the value of those funds has increased by more than 400% from 2019 to 2020 only. So this actually, it's a proof that, you know, there is, um, there is a very a strong appetite and a strong demand on those uh, structures because of the um, um, flexibility that they uh, provide to those uh, fund managers. Wonderful. And that's an interesting 400% increase in sovereign wealth funds. In, in one year, yes. That's uh, fantastic. Um, all right, let's move then from uh, structuring and domicile questions to the specific issues which drive sovereign wealth investment. And perhaps we can start with you, Sarah, from Soul Asset Management, uh, given you've led a number of such investments. Once an asset geography and class is determined um, by the sovereign investors, how do you go about selecting where to place funds and what are sovereign investors' um, primary considerations? First of all, thank you for having me. Um, good morning to all. Um, so by nature, the investors are long-term investors. So we are aware of the short-term dynamics of the market. However, we do follow a core satellite approach that will allow uh, the investors to look at the small tilts um, that they can invest and take advantage of in the market. It is then followed by a very thorough manager selection process. It's about selecting the right manager for the bucket of investment that we're looking for. Uh, once a manager is selected, some key considerations that um, a manage, uh, an investor might look at um, in the sovereign wealth space is uh, the management of the fund or the investment. How stable is the team, the turnover, how well they work with each other, experiences. And we do that through a lot of um, uh, looking at the experience, face-to-face -face meetings, reference calls. Other uh, key consideration is the track record, which I think everyone looks at. Um, it is important 
to know how the returns are derived. Is it derived by the market or by the team's ability to drive those returns, their operational improvements? Um, another key consideration is also assessing the governance of the investment and the decision-making process. I think these are the main points uh, to be looked at. Okay, so you're looking at data, uh, essentially, uh, when you're analyzing at the high level. Here, if I can come to you, have you noticed any trends or differences over, you know, looking over the longer term in terms of the sophistication of in-house teams within sovereign wealth uh, investors? And has that taken any investors by surprise or sorry, asset managers by surprise? Thanks, Brian. I think, um, I think it'd be fair to say, um, and I'll be sort of uh, rather sort of tongue in cheek, that there has been a sort of an evolution in terms of the in-house sort of sophistication of, uh, of sovereign wealth funds. Um, if I were to sort of draw back the, the, the clock um, a couple of decades, then I could sort of see that there was, a, there was an argument that sovereign wealth funds were majority investors with a minority mindset in the sense that they were sort of relying greatly upon the, the manager and the sort of sponsor to sort of deal with the, you know, with sort of key issues which were sort of germane to their investment rather than sort of having these sort of in-house resource to address those sort of directly. But what we have sort of seen is that there has been a, a significant sort of gearing up um, in terms of in-house departments, and there has been um, an increased sort of sophistication in the ways of assessments, an assessment is made of, a, of an investment opportunity. And there is a, a very clear guideline and principle which needs to be uh, adhered to by the by the manager, uh, you know, if that investment is going to be going to be made, and in some ways that is a that is a welcome development. It's a development which has happened over over a number of years. But um, what it ensures is it ensures that everyone understands what the requirements are of the sovereign wealth fund um, before it is uh, willing to sort of entertain an opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, that's certainly my experience too. And unfortunately, I have from time to time seen international asset managers undermine the regional expertise and capabilities uh, of the local investment teams um, to their cost and detriment when it comes to the final negotiated position. So uh, maybe if I come back to you, from an investment perspective, are there any early red flags which can lead to a deal or no deal decision? Yeah, uh, I think so. I think most investors would consider red flags as the track record and the high turnover in management, but equally important points that are sometimes missed are uh, when a manager or um, the counterpart is not as forthcoming with the information, um, things can be discussed uh, uh, verbally, but not documented. I believe having those confirmed by the manager in writing always gives that comfort level and the validity of the investment. Um, there will always be items that will be only discussed verbally, but when it comes to matters of governance, decision-making, involvement in the investment, commercial points, all of these should be you know, confirmed um, not only verbally, but also in writing. Another red flag that I would point out is not having the proper alignment of interest, um, having skin in the game. Uh, what I mean by this, it is always important to see managers invest in their own product. If the investment is not doing well, um, we would like to see that alignment of interest between, you know, the LPs and GPs, um, the investors and the counterpart, and also having the, their carried uh, tied into the products as well. Um, it's, it's very important to see the win-win win, win situation between the two parties. Thank you. If I can stay with you, uh, when it comes to the documentation then, which investment terms receive the most attention and, and get the most discussion? Okay, so the investment terms I think that would receive the most attention and discussions are clauses pertaining to the investment there is ability to terminate the GP's involvement, especially at, at fault. Uh, key person provisions are very important, not only the clause itself, but who's involved in that clause, the right people and the right provisions there, because they're always there. But is it the right one or is it not? That's for, I mean, the team to assess. Uh, investment limits uh, to me in consideration would be concentration li limits. And also, does it fit into the client's, I mean, overall portfolio construction and limits? Uh, being that the investors are either uh, sovereign wealth funds or quasi-government, confidentiality is also very key and imperative uh, um, part of the discussion. 
Um, and in line with what has been said earlier in, in terms of transparency, um, I think reporting and transparency are, are key discussion items. Um, people are more, uh, investors are much more sophisticated and require that level of reporting and uh, transparency. And I would say be involved or try as much as possible to be involved in the decision making, uh, be part of the LPACs or any type of board or investment committee that you can be part of. I think these are the most important um, considerations. At the end of the day, the, these are long-term relationships, and by uh, setting clear and thorough reporting on day one will ensure that it has more stability and uh, for it to be a long-term relationship. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Mirek, if I might be able to come back to you, are you seeing a level of collaboration uh, being offered to sovereign wealth investors at the outset when it comes to initial structuring and fund terms? or are managers still creating a structure and then looking to sell that to sovereign investors later on? Thank you, Brian. Um, I, th I think the answer is it depends. And just before I can delve into it, I totally echo Hera's and Sarah's comments around the increased level of sophistication of the in-house in teams of the sovereign wealth funds and the importance on governance and due diligence, not only on the underlying investments, but also on the actual key players within that um, uh, 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 you know, fund management space. Um, I have seen situations where a sovereign wealth fund effectively seeds a, a VC, you know, uh, I call it kind of high risk, high potential fund um, as the anchor investors. And it, in that sense, it really has a powerful voice around the level of its involvement. Um, you know, the choice of domicile for the fund, um, having a seat on the fund board, uh, assessment of due diligence around the target assets. On the other hand, uh, if you look at the big players in the PE, PE space, the large PE fund managers, um, for them, some of the funds are quite often actually considered as a, as a regular institutional investor. So they have not much uh, special treatment in relation to the, uh, to, to the choices of fund domicile and, and any other decisions. One thing I'd like to also mention is that quite often investments are thematic and intended to develop national agenda. Um, so in, in that sense, the Southern Wealth Fund then um, you know, the scrutiny tends to be much closer around the kind of social and societal benefits of the investment. And this is basically over and above the kind of pure investment return. Thank you, Mira. Um, Mira, do you have any thoughts on pre-structuring with the anchor investors and the merits of that? Yeah, of course, uh, uh, Brian. I think, you know, just with my sort of tax hat on, um, if I had a, a sponsor coming to a sort of a sovereign wealth fund, um, and saying, look, um, come into the UK um, through a through a sort of UK corporate entity or through an offshore corporate entity, a, a sort of a, um, a sort of a, 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 an opaque structure, you know, from a tax perspective. Then I think the one question which I would sort of pose as a sovereign wealth fund is that in some ways you are reducing the level of return. Uh, which I'm gaining from this investment by, by 25%, which is the sort of headline rate, uh, you know, which corporate UK corporation tax is going to be. And you are not affording me the ability to leverage my sovereign wealth status. So there's a big question mark on why I should want to come into that sort of structure in the first place. If it means, firstly, I can't sort of secure the, the benefit of my sort of sovereign status, and secondly, the impact of that is, is, a, is, a, net, is a net loss, a, a reduction in IRR by 25%. So it, you know, it, doesn't, it doesn't sort of make sense. I think, I think it's a case of that um, managers and sponsors just need to be absolutely alert to that and ensure that any sort of structure which they sort of put forward does get, that, um, it does get past that first hurdle to the, uh, to the start line. I'd imagine they should be speaking to tax consultants at the outset then. Uh, here, if we can stay with you, um, we're commonly seeing more um, master and feeder fund structures being offered to sovereign investors in the region. Um, is that an accurate perception? And what are the drivers of that? Do sovereign investors need to consider anything in particular when they are offered a participation in a feeder structure feeding into a master fund? Yeah, look, I mean, master feeder structures have been around for a very, very long time. And in terms of the, the feeder structure, the, the sort of main um, raison d'etre for having that there in the first place is to bring together a community of investor who have the same sort of tax profile. 
So if it was a feeder structure, which comprised entirely of, uh, of sovereign wealth funds, then that's absolutely fine. You know, I, I don't sort of see any, any particular issue which arises from a, from a tax perspective um, of having that structure. Where the difficulties can sometimes arise is if I have a feeder structure which comprises a majority of sovereign wealth funds, but then includes other sort of tax exempt entities, which may in reality not be tax exempt. So, you know, some pension funds are tax exempt for the majority of their business, but they may have business which isn't sort of tax exempt. That can sort of taint the, you know, the, the characterization of the feeder structure. And the other thing which I've sometimes found is that um, feeder structures inadvertently include conventional sort of taxpayers. So a mistake is made by the manager or the sponsor and a, an entity is admitted into the feeder, which isn't sort of tax exempt or doesn't have the sort of same profile as a sovereign wealth fund. And again, that is a risk which we need to be sort of alert to. Thank you, Hira. Zina, if I can come back to you. Looking at Middle East sovereign investors, are there any regional trends and issues which asset managers should be alive to when approaching them? And are there any hot sectors? Yeah, um, I think in terms of sectors, we've definitely seen a move away from the traditional fixed income strategies um, into more of the private markets uh, and certain asset classes that we've seen a lot of the Middle East sovereigns go into recently, the likes of Mubadla, Adia, Saudi is obviously the renewables sector. Um, that's really been a key investment uh, for many of them and I think will remain into the future. Um, also things like um, medical science, data, all of those type of things. And I think I echo the sentiment around building their own teams. I've certainly seen that um, working with them for a number of years. They chose to outsource many of their various international locations. And now you're seeing them build their own real credible teams with very high profile individuals and taking the management of their assets in-house. And I think they've... Um, they've responded well and that the assets have performed better in some instances from what we've seen. So I certainly think that will be a trend. We've also seen a wave of sovereign wealth funds targeting the public markets, distressed public companies where they've been looking to potentially take those private. Um, and I think that might well continue um, into the future as well. Thank you, Zina. Mirang, if I could ask you the same question, have you noticed any regional trends or issues which asset managers should be alive to and are there any particular sectors you're noticing? I, th I think I think uh, the incubation kind of the fintech um, is, is an interesting space and, and and going back to Sarah's point around the governance and, and diligence I think what I would recommend to those up and coming investment managers in that space have a good story for the seven wealth fund um, uh, you know demonstrate your, tra your track record but also work on your governance because uh, the transparency point is very very important for you know for, for, for these funds. Thank you. If I can stay with you, um, are funds offered to sovereign investors subject to higher controls, governance, independent audit requirements and the like than to when you compare it to typical investment products you see offered, even against, for example, um, products which are anchored by financial institutions? That's a good point. I mean, I suppose due to the public nature of the ownership of the seven well funds, clearly the scrutiny, you know, reporting audit requirements are much higher. Um, all those seven well funds that have subscribed to the IWG's generally accepted principles and practices, as, as Zina mentioned, the Santiago principles, they have voluntarily basically agreed to abide by higher level of scrutiny in their home nations, which is very important as well. I think, I think also the level of scrutiny or reporting is driven by the legal framework around something about well fund itself. Um, 
you have effectively three three types of available funds. One is just the accumulation of the asset, the pool of the asset, and then obviously the kind of ownership control and reporting is for the central bank. Um, the other kind of model is, is um, you know, a kind of state-owned corporation, which is governed by, let's say, general principle of company law, but still some specifics of wealth fund legislation. Again, this is a different type of reporting. And you can have all sorts of wealth funds. We have seen, for example, in Asia, which are basically uh, instituted by, you know, constitutive law, and uh, they are effectively governed by public legislation. So each of those types of alpha basically would have slightly different types of pu public public reporting and scrutiny and obviously audit, depending on how they are structured themselves. Okay, Mirik, I suppose on a related point then, um, with an administration firm hat on, how do administrators support that function and what is the role of administrators when it comes to sovereign wealth funds? But I wouldn't say that the role of the administrator would be any different from any other typical, you know, generally marketed funds, to be honest, Brian. Um, again, it depends on what level of influence will this mean wealth fund exercise, you know, again, the, the kind of argument as the anchor investor versus the normal institutional investor. So I don't see the major difference there. Right. Thank you very much for that. Um, that's been really interesting. I know uh, a lot more now about what's important and why um, certain issues are important to um, sovereign wealth funds. If I can move on to the next broader topic, which is uh, the zeitgeist now, ESG. And um, by ESG, we mean environment, social and governance. Uh, we know that two thirds of the region's sovereign wealth funds have signed up to various ESG frameworks and $3 trillion of investment is represented in the One Planet Sovereign Wealth Fund Working Group, which includes Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, Saudi Arabia's Public Investment Fund, Qatar Investment Authority and Kuwait Investment Authority, uh, with some international um, sovereign wealth funds joining them. In the GCC, we see national visions now, including uh, cohesive society, uh, sustainable environment and integrated infrastructure. We see that in Bahrain's 2030 vision, uh, the UAE vision 21, Abu Dhabi's 2030 vision and Saudi Arabia's vision 2030. Uh, regional bosses are now promoting ESG reporting frameworks. And we know the IFRS Foundation is looking at a single global ESG framework. We also are uh, experiencing on uh, the debt side that access to interbank lines is increasingly pressured by a requirement from international banks for their partners to be supporting ESG compliance. So with that backdrop, Mirek, um, how important is ESG to sovereign wealth investors in the Middle East? And how does that manifest itself? I think, I mean, clearly ESG has to become an important element of how sovereign wealth funds deliver their long-term value to their local nations. But also importantly to the nations in the countries they invest in. Um, we have seen most of the Middle Eastern some of wealth funds come up with the set of ESG, you know, objectives, principal values, and you can actually see it's clearly visible on the, on the websites and uh, it ranges from the kind of do no harm up to really impactful investment. Um, in my view, uh, whilst it's great to see some of wealth funds become, you know, signatories of the One Planet as WF working group and, but I think more can be done around realizing the positive impact that some of funds can collectively exercise. I, I think it is the journey from the minimum requirements and the PR activities around uh, ESG to fully embracing ESG and practicing it at the sort of fund level as well as the portfolio companies level. Um, you know, considering that some of funds are effectively investment arms of the governments. In, and in that capacity, they have that financial power to deliver tangible change on a large environmental scale. And I believe that it has yet to happen, to be honest. Okay, thank you. Uh, Zina, have you seen any specific sovereign investment structures uh, developed associated with the association? Yeah, we have actually. So Jersey um, has really been at the forefront of developing a um, commitment to building a more sustainable um, strategy for a greener economy. And they set out their vision for 2030 um, and done some quite detailed work on that. And I really think that's been to their benefit because they recently were selected for a 
fund which is backed by Saudi sovereign money. I think it's a one billion dollar fund, um, technology fund, structured as a Jersey private fund in Jersey, Sharia compliant fund um, for the sustainable investment. So I think that's a very specific um, example of where, where a domestic jurisdiction has been selected specifically because it was seen to be building a better sustainable future. Wonderful. Um, many of the region's sovereign wealth investors work on a Sharia compliant framework. Um, and in that regard, Mohammed, maybe if I can turn to you, is there a natural link and perhaps an overlap between what's the new ESG thing and obviously the much more traditional Sharia compliance thing? Indeed, Brian, I think the, the, the main principle of do no harm that goes, I mean, without saying the Sharia principle, uh, whether the no harm to humans or no harm to environment. Uh, so this is well entrenched for, you know, in, in the main, you know, Sharia principle. Uh, in addition to that, I mean, in, in terms of the governance, I mean, um, and I think the record shows that Islamic financing have been resilient in terms of uh, being an asset based financing, uh, which is the whole idea of Sharia, you know, financing and be in no time variance. So in addition that all, you know, Sharia financing, you know, banks and, and um, you know, agencies, they have their own independent Sharia boards, which have their own independent audits. So I think this is naturally, you know, goes in, in the main principles of the Islamic financing and the Sharia based financing, uh, all these principles of not protecting, you know, people, environment, and making sure of the transparency and the independence evaluation of all transaction. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, maybe, Mirk, if I can come back to you again, with the growing importance of ESG, how is that affecting the services that asset managers and administrators are offering? And is it creating an increased workload for the service professionals? Thank you, Brian. I think the key is in proper reporting, to be honest, and that is kind of well constructed around the each of the letter of ESG uh, with the objective of kind of pre and benchmarking. Um, the asset managers and administrators who can, in my view, provide some of those funds with such reporting will be in the pole position to deliver added value in that space. Um, there is certainly going to be initial work around, you know, mapping um, the, the, um, the activities and the ESG against that seven wealth funds uh, values, objectives and, and policies. Uh, and obviously creating key, ma key metrics on the reporting. But in my view, once the reporting um, has uh, kind of kicked in and the kind of initial mapping has been has been done, it is purely an automated process of obviously reporting uh, from, from the manager back to the um, Southern Health Fund as the LP. And, and it should be fairly automated in my view. Okay. And, and what's the prime content of that sort of reporting? Yeah. The, um, so, so I suppose, I mean, um, really, it, it, is a, it, is, it is a choice of um, where the investment goes. If it is basically on the environmental level of sustainability, you look ba basically at the kind of well-established benchmarks, um, which, which are kind of objective uh, for, for that. If it is on the, on the, on the social level, um, you're looking at, obviously, key matrix around people, diversity, inclusion, et cetera, and the, and the portfolio uh, companies. And on the governance level, again, it is a number of criteria ranging from bribery, corruption, you know, anti-money laundering, et cetera, in, in the local jurisdictions of the, of the investments. Okay. Um, we uh, don't have a great deal of time left, but if anybody uh, who's watching uh, this panel session would like to ask us a question, please do. Um, put your questions uh, in the Q&A function. Uh, we have one, with travel less evident and teleconferencing more prevalent, how has this changed the propensity to onboard new managers? Maybe I can start with you, Hira, in relation to that. Yes, I, I think, uh, Brian, just on that, I think it's the case of that um, we haven't sort of noticed any, uh, any sort of you know, reluctance in terms of... Uh, appointing sort of new managers um, or, you know, give, if there is a, sort of a pressing need for it. I think the areas which we have noticed a, a bit of a slowdown has been in terms of investment. Um, so certainly with sort of COVID, it's been the case that certain sovereign wealth funds have written into their constitution that, um, you know, sort of key stakeholders within the sovereign wealth fund must physically visit an asset before 
they can endorse uh, or allow an investment to take place. And the fact that they've not been able to sort of visit the asset themselves has, has frustrated the, um, you know, the, the, their sort of making an investment. But going back to managers, I, I, I haven't sort of noticed any, um, any, any, sort of a, any sort of reluctance on the part to either appoint or, or, or disappoint um, uh, managers. Okay, um, I've got another question come in. Um, and perhaps I can open this up to the panel more generally. Um, what would be your three takeaways for managers looking to impress sovereign wealth funds? Um, maybe we can start with you, Sarah. What would be the key takeaways for managers looking to impress sovereign wealth funds? I'd say more transparency. I think transparency is key. Um, um, having more alignment, um, uh, allowing the sovereign wealth funds or sovereign, it being a more of a partnership um, and a more of a partnership um, than just purely LPGP investor and counterpart. Um, because we can see uh, that sovereign wealth funds, um, pension funds and whatnot are being more active, more involved in the relationship and decision making, and they're becoming more asset owners. So just to keep up with everything, I think that's just, uh, a key point is to make it a partnership more than anything. Perfect. Zina, do you have any thoughts? What should asset managers be doing if they're looking to impress sovereign wealth funds? They definitely need a defined ESG strategy because they probably are not going to get through due diligence without that. I think the quality of their team and their track record um, and the depth of their strategy is key for me as well. Uh, understanding of culture, um, paramount. Okay. Uh, well, we are drawing quite close to the end. So perhaps we can have a look at uh, the future and our crystal balls. And if I could ask each of you, what do you expect will be the developments affecting sovereign wealth managers over the medium term? Maybe I can start with you, Fatima. So Fatima, I think you're on mute. Thank you, Brian, sorry, I missed that. Uh, well, I think um, post the pandemic, um, it will be very important for fund managers to uh, look at areas or asset classes that build resilience towards um, economic shocks. So um, at least in the medium term, they will have to reshuffle their priori priorities towards uh, more mature asset classes and more uh, complex asset classes, maybe. Um, I think ESG is, um, is a key area. Uh, that uh, most fund managers will have to look, in, look into uh, venture capital investments, uh, startups, uh, um, uh, financial uh, fintech technology. These are all hot topics that are coming up. And I think fund, manage, fund managers will have to deviate a bit or like kind of um, um, uh, have better portfolios, better manage their portfolios in those areas. Um, uh, and other things also related to um, health issues, uh, medicine, security, food supplies, things like that. This is internationally, but from a regional perspective, I think um, a game changer will be um, the new passporting regime that is on the verge of being uh, issued by the GCC countries very soon, which will actually streamline um, uh, the marketing process of uh, in a fund, um, sorry, uh, investment products, our financial products in general, but the first stage will be uh, funds, uh, both uh, public and uh, private uh, funds. So I think uh, through this um, new passporting regime, a lot of fund managers, especially sovereign wealth fund managers, will have um, new doors open to them to, them to explore the opportunities uh, within the GCC region. That's fascinating, Fatima. And obviously, passporting is something that uh, the industry has been looking for for a long time. Uh, do you have any indicative timeline of when passporting may be introduced? Is it uh, a two to three year, or a five year, or, or a much shorter period? Obviously, no one's going to hold you to it, Fatima. <laughs> it is difficult to, to give a timeline for that, but it's towards the end. Wonderful. Um, so, if I can then turn to you here, what do you expect will be the developments affecting sovereign wealth? Uh, managers over the medium term. Okay, Brian, looking through the crystal ball, um, I'll present one risk and one opportunity. Um, the, the risk, you know, with, with my sort of tax hat on, is that we're emerging from a, uh, from a sort of a, into a sort of a post-COVID environment. 
which is almost akin to, you know, in, in terms of certain governments as to coming out of World War II. Um, fiscal authorities are being sort of charged with the responsibility of raising revenues quite aggressively, and the courts are going to be sort of supporting them in that. So one thing to be alert on is do make sure that your sort of structures and processes and protocols are capable of standing up to scrutiny because we can sort of see sentiment on the, on the part of sort of tax authorities changing quite substantially over the next few years when they sort of move into an aggressive sort of uh, tax raising mode. That's the risk. The opportunity um, going back to ESG is certainly in terms of impact in investing and assets which are underpinned by a, a strong social purpose. I think that's a sort of great opportunity going forward. Thank you, Hera. Um, Sarah, same question. Uh, I'll allude to the same uh, uh, kind of answer I uh, mentioned earlier and also back to Hera's point of having an impact and impact investing. I think sovereign wealth funds and quasi-government and investors are going to be more active, more involved. I think they're going to be more asset owners. It's already starting. We can see it in, in Bahrain, with Usul, with Wafra, with Mubadala. They're becoming more asset owners and they get to decide what type of investing, impact investing, uh, social investing that they're, they're looking at. And I think this is key also. And I can see it happening very soon. Thank you, Sarah. Mohammed, if I can turn to you, what do you expect will be developments affecting sovereign wealth man managers over the medium term? Thanks, Brian. I think along the same line that mentioned by my colleagues, I mean, is the ESG and probably now, uh, it is more the cautious on looking on the development impact of these investments. I think now, seriously, I mean, it's it's all, all investors, wealth funds and beyond are looking not just for the returns, but to truly for the social responsibility of their investments and what they can do with it. So hopefully we'll continue in that direction. Thank you. Zina, do you have any thoughts? I guess the reduction of quantitative of easing and the effects of, of COVID are going to impact their investment strategies. Um, also political focus and shift towards social change around gender equality, reduction in corruption, things like that. Uh, I agree with Hira and Sarah. I think sovereign wealth funds have got a great opportunity now to be the real catalyst for change. Um, their long-term investment parameters and the volume of the assets, um, they have the opportunity to make a real impact on building a better sustainable economy. Thank you, Zina. And Mirek, if I can give you the last word from the panel. That's the most difficult part, Brian, because my fellow uh, panelists are both very good at a crystal ball glazing and they said it all. Um, I would say just, just to kind of add one thing is that I, I can see mo more JV style of investments, uh, um, funds working closely together, becoming more kind of global citizens, uh, thinking about maybe recycling their local currencies, reinvesting the money back into the local um, economies. I think that's very important. I, th I think in in uh, in in the kind of line of um, the post-COVID uh, ESG era. Wonderful. Well, thank you all. Uh, uh, we've run out of time for the panel. I really do appreciate all of your wonderful responses. I thought these questions were going to be tricky, but none of them stumped you. So thank you for that. Um, Faisal, if I can hand back to you. Thank you very much, Brian, and uh, thank you to your panelists for a riveting uh, discussion. I agree with you. Uh, it's been entertaining and you know, the time has passed and we're in the last few minutes. So I'll do, I'll do my summary very, very quickly. I think key takeaways from me uh, are the increasing influence of sovereign wealth funds is clear, whether nationally, regionally or internationally um, or globally. Um, sovereign wealth funds are at the forefront of diversification um, the diversification agenda regionally, obviously, but also um, in support of their political goals um, and uh, support of, as businesses and families and individuals and their citizens come out of the crisis, sovereign wealth funds are playing an important part, certainly in the region, in supporting that too. Uh, and finally, even from me, it, it's, it's very clear from your expert speakers and yourself that ESG considerations 
and the sustainability agenda is here to stay and develop and grow. We don't know where it'll be in 12 months time and hopefully we'll have you guys back on board to talk about it and see whether there has been significant changes in that uh, in that field. And it's interesting to hear your speakers talk about this being driven not only from the investor side, but from the investment side and consumer side. So that's been uh, that's been an excellent, excellent uh, panel. I think thank you from me. So I'll start by saying thank you to all our listeners. Uh, we appreciate your time. We hope you found this uh, uh, the, the panel discussion and the uh, keynote speech from the Central Bank of Bahrain useful. Um, but, you know, we're, we're, it's been a pleasure having you on, the, on here. Thank you to uh, the Central Bank of Bahrain, Bahrain uh, Ibtisam and Fatima. Thank you for your participation. We appreciate your time and your insights. Thank you to all of our panelists and their organizations. So Usul Asset Management and Sara, uh, Islamic Development Bank and Muhammad, uh, BDO and Hira, uh, IQEQ and Mirac, LGL Group and Zina. So thank you to all of you for taking the time. Obviously, Fatima from the CBB also used uh, uh, for your insights on the panel discussion. Um, finally, uh, and by no means uh, uh, the, the least from our side, thank you to our co-hosts and partners for this event, uh, Trowers and Hamlins. Uh, thank you, Brian and Nick, for your time and your colleagues that have done the hard work in the background for this third and hopefully the next one will be a physical one uh, somewhere in the region and watch this space. Recording will be available for this session for those that registered and haven't been able to attend or those that want to um, hear any of the session again. Um, uh, we have had several Q&A that came through when you registered for the event. And as the Trowers team um, have indicated, uh, these will, uh, you know, they will come back to you individually and provide some um, specific information on there. So, um, final thing from me: if you, if there is anything specific that you would like to discuss, if you want to talk about any of the uh, information that's been um, talked about today, then do please get in touch with us. Um, you know, all of us will be delighted to assist, um, and 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 we look forward to seeing you again. So, thank you so much, and, and have a great day.